So in today's video, I'm going to be going over a case study of one of my previous stores. I'm going to go over my thought process, my approach, and the different techniques that I used to create a profitable store. More specifically, I'm going to go over product selection, marketing materials, website creation, and everyone's favorite, Facebook ads. Pretty much, I'm going to give everyone an A to Z walkthrough of my entire process. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. So the store that I'm going to go over today is called Clearbrow. I did about 24k revenue in about 30 days. The reason the store died out was because I turned off the ads for about seven days and when I turned them back on, they just never performed the same. As you can see here, this is when I shut them off for about seven days and when I turned them back on, um, I could just never get to the same profitability that I had before, which is fine. That just means that I can make a case study out of it for everyone watching this video. The product was sold for $24.99 and the cost of the product was $6. What really drove profitability though was the cross sell that I had. The product was an eyebrow thetter, which we'll see later. And I also sold extra threads on the side for $7, where the cost of the threads was just $1. And as you can see from the data, more than 50% of the people that bought the threader bought extra threads. So 828 people bought the uh, uh, units were sold and 433. Um, units of the extra threads were sold. So now for the actual website. So for the home page, I like to have a hero banner that links to the product page, a small description of the product itself, and some images and text followed by customer testimonials and an about us section talking about how the store originated. In the footer, I like to have a tab for helpful links, which just has all the policies. And this can all be generated using Shopify's templates. I think the only one that can't is a shipping policy. So you can just copy one of your, um, one of the stores that you, you really like and just use their shipping policy and change a few words. I also like to have another tab for the customer service hours just to help your store look a little bit more professional. And also every single button that I have leads to the product page. So that one leads to the product page. I go back this one goes to the product page as well like i said before the hero banner also goes to the product page so for the menu tabs all i have is a home page um, i have the product page contact us and track your order it's relatively simple as a main goal of the website is just to get the customer to convert so now let's look at the product page so whenever you're creating a product page you want to optimize above the fold that means being able to see the product name the product image the price the number of reviews for social proof and lastly the percentage discount if there is one by making sure all this information is present above the fold the customer will know that they land on the right page but also get all the vital information that they need right when they land on your page so always 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 optimize above the fold if you do realize that you can't fit all this information above the fold, it's usually because the picture is too big. So just change the aspect ratio of your pictures to a more rectangular ratio and you should be fine. Also, um, I just want to touch on for the first image of your product page, you want to have someone using the product. More specifically, you want to show a face. People love seeing other people's faces. So always try to include that into your first picture on your product page. So now moving down the page, instead of having a boring old add to cart call to action, um, I changed the text to buy now. You can do this by going into your Shopify backend, clicking online store themes, and then instead of clicking customize theme, click the drop down beside it and click edit languages. It was actually mandatory for me to change this from add to cart to buy now, because if you click this button, you don't, you don't add to cart. I just made it go straight to checkout. So for the format of the product page, I pretty much use the same format each time for the product pages that I create. So this is the template that I use. Um, this will be linked in the, in the uh, description below. So how I like to structure my product page 
is with an attention grabbing headline. This can either be in the form of a pain point, a best benefit, or a bold claim. In this instance, I went with a bold claim, claiming that you can instantly remove unwanted facial errors. Just make sure if you go with the bold claim route, it actually holds up. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're using this eyebrow threader, you are instantly <laughs> removing facial hair. So that's why this, this bold claim is okay to use and not just some sort of crazy claim that is not true. So the next portion of the template or structure that I use is a subheadline. Um, I put the sub, sub, sub headline as optional. I just like to use one if I can think of a subheadline because it helps lure the reader into the body text. But if you don't have one, that's okay as well. Next, I either put a small paragraph explaining the benefits of the product or put a bullet point list of benefits. So if you have a product that has a ton of benefits, I would make a bullet, um, bullet point list so that you don't have to write a huge paragraph. But in this case, there's one main benefit. So I opted to go with the paragraph rope. And as you can see, the paragraph's not too wordy. So it's still somewhat legible for the reader. And also notice that everything that I'm talking about in the first few sentences is very heavily benefit driven. So remember, features tell and benefits sell. The main factors that are gonna sell your product is not that it was made with high quality plastic or the size of the product or the fact that it has a really cool color but rather explaining how the product will improve their life, how it's gonna remove unwanted facial hairs or help them achieve sleek, attractive brows or help them get luscious skin. Explain how it's gonna make their life better. You want your copywriting on your product page to really emphasize the benefits of your products. Benefits are what's gonna make your customers or convince your customers to pull out their credit cards. In the body paragraph, also notice how I bolded the important words. Keep in mind that only 20% of people read past your headline. So by bolding important words or phrases in your body copy that you want your customer to read, it, it'll, uh, it'll really help grab their attention and make sure that your points are, are going across to your reader. Scrolling down the product page, I have a GIF of the product in action. This is always useful to help explain what the product does or reinforce what the product does. And after that, I have a small paragraph and then a call to action that says, get yours now for 50% off and free shipping. After that, I have tabs to condense the rest of the information on my page. So by using tabs, um, it has its pros and cons. The good thing is that it makes the product page more aesthetically pleasing and also the customer journey to get to the reviews, which is extremely important, is much shorter. But the bad thing about using tabs is that it hides information. The reason why I decided to use tabs is because I believe the first portion of my product page, so this portion right here, is good enough to do the selling. And also by condensing the tabs, the customers can get to the reviews a lot quicker. And if the customer wants to know, or know more about the features or shipping info or the money back guarantee or the FAQ, they can just click on the tab and not be overloaded with content. So that was my thought process behind using tabs. For the reviews, if you can include pictures in your reviews, though that's always better. It looks a lot more legitimate and it's much better to see how the product looks in the perspective of the customers and not just how the company wants the product to look. So now that we've gone over the website, let's go over how I actually chose a product in the PowerPoint presentation. So the selection process for this product was kind of a weird one. The first time that I tested this product was almost a year ago exactly and it was the second product that I ever tested. As it was only my second product, it did not go very well because I had no idea what I was doing and it was simply not in demand. But when the global pandemic hit, I had the idea of testing this product again since it was perfect for someone that was stuck inside. The idea came to me when I was browsing social media and found this product, um, this eyebrow epilator. At first, I was gonna test this product since it was a really great product for lockdown but at the same time, so many people were testing it. I checked on AdSpy and I think I saw 20 plus stores selling it. So I was like, no, thank you. So instead of competing with all these other stores, I took a step back and looked at the winning market rather than the winning product. Yes, the product was selling, but why? There was a market for the home beauty solutions, but more specifically, there was a market for at home beauty solutions for your brows. So by identifying 
a winning market instead of a winning product, it gives you much more options to create a profitable store. So with this thought process, a light bulb went off in my head and I remembered the product that I was selling just a year ago, my second product that I ever sold. Keep in mind the same strategy can be replicated for any type of product. If you see a product doing well and you think you can sell a different product that can also satisfy the market that an existing product was in, then the chances are that you can make a lot of sales as well. So instead of looking for winning products, try researching a starving market and then find a product that fits within it. So for this product, I implemented the same testing strategy that I outlined in the previous video I created on e-commerce agency called Why Your Facebook Ads Suck. And I created three headlines, three video ads, three thumbnails, and three ad copies. I found the best variation of each of these three components and used that to test the product. So now I'll hop into my computer and show you guys the ad copies that I created as well as the video that I created. So here are the ad copies that I created. One of them was called introducing. The main thing that I changed was the headline, which is introducing a shockingly easy method for smooth skin, eyebrows getting out of control and instantly remove unwanted facial hairs at home. And these are the three headlines that I tested. So the best one was this one that I highlighted, our eyebrows getting out of control. And the best headline that, that I got was 50% off sale and soon. So I combined this, the ad copy, um, the video that I'll show you in a sec, and the thumbnail to create the optimized creative. So now I'm gonna play the video ad. All right, so now let's get into Facebook ads. For testing, I use ad set budget campaigns. I like to use ad set budget campaigns for testing because it gives me more control. What I mean by this is when I would use CBO, even when setting minimum ad spends, the spend was never even, which is okay when scaling, but when testing interest, you wanna give each interest a fair chance to perform. Also, when you're stuck in that awkward phase of killing bad ad sets and duplicating winning ones, Doing so within the CBO campaign can mean that you can ruin the optimization and the previous sales that you were getting, the momentum that you had could become completely throttled. So this is the experience that I've had with CBO, which is why I like to use ad sets budget to test and CBO to scale. So let me hop into my computer and I'll walk you through how I set up my interest testing campaign. All right, so I just hopped into my computer and I'm creating a campaign using quick creation. You can use guided creation, but you know, all the options are still the same. It's just a different interface. And I just, I just like using quick creation. The interface is better to me. So interest testing and I'm using ad set budget. Campaign objective is going to be conversions. We don't know the ad set name yet and the ad name is going to be optimized creative. So we're just going to save to draft and continue adding the ad set level. The conversion event you're going to want to set to purchase. The daily budget is going to be 20. Now you can use whatever budget here. Just make sure you still follow the rules of killing the ad set if it doesn't get any sales at 1.5 times your break even cost per acquisition. So that's going to your your break even cost per acquisition or cost per purchase is going to be your product cost or your selling cost minus your product cost. Start date I usually set it so if today's the 8th, I'm going to set it to something like later down the line like the 12th. I just do that because you know, if it doesn't, if, it, if I set it to tomorrow, which is the 9th at 12 a.m. and it gets approved, you know, tomorrow at 4 p.m., it's going to start running at 4 and not evenly distribute my budget. And if it doesn't evenly distribute my budget and tries to spend the whole $20 in, you know, in six hours instead of 24 hours, it can ruin the optimization and, and the performance of your ads. So that's why I like to set it a further date. Once I get it approved, I just set it to the next day that um, to launch the next day. So location, I just did United States for the product that I was testing. Age, I did 21. 
to 65 plus gender i changed it to woman because it was a woman specified product detail targeting so you can just put any sort of interest that relates to your product i would go quite general here you can go with brands magazines influencers so in this case i think benefit cosmetics is just a brand for the potential reach you want to go above 5 million and below 150 million um, this is at 120 but because detail targeting expansion is on so we turn that off okay so it's at 7 million which is fine you want to exclude aliexpress drop shipping like always And then you don't we don't need to touch languages the only time you would touch languages is if you're selling to non-english speaking countries and since united states is an english speaking country we don't have to change that at all placements is going to be automatic placements for the conversion window we're going to do one day click since our product is below 50 dollars. and then for the creative all you're going to do is take the the most optimal components from your creative testing stage and put that in your your ad so you take your best video best headline best thumbnail and best ad copy and then you're just going to put that into your creative and then what i'm going to do is actually just change the name of the ad set and then i'm going to duplicate it you can duplicate it five to ten times so you want a total of five to ten ad sets um, when i was testing i did ten but for demonstration purposes i'm just going to do four and I'll show you how I change the interest. It's very straightforward. So for each ad set, I'm just gonna change the interest. So we're technically gonna be split testing interest in this case. Um, so instead of benefit cosmetics, again, super broad. So you can pick whatever, just make sure the potential reaches above 5 million. So I'm just gonna pick Sephora. Copy and paste that, double click, double click here. Suggestions again, Mac Cosmetics. Perfect. So we have our ad set budget campaign for interest testing. We have five different interests in five different ad sets and you just press publish, review and publish, and then you're ready to go. So for rules to scaling and killing ad sets, if an ad set spends 1.5 times the break even cost per purchase, then I would turn off the ad set. If an ad set gets three sales, I would duplicate it three times. And I would also break it down by country, age, and platform. For example, if an ad set got three sales and it made a sale in Canada, USA, um, the age group of 24 to 35, and Instagram and Facebook, I would duplicate it five times. And for each ad set, I would narrow down the targeting to USA only, one for Canada only, one for 25 to 35 only, and one for IG and the other for Facebook. I would also con continue testing new interests. So what I do, I keep repeating the same process that I just mentioned, keep testing new interests until it hit 2,075% video viewers. And then I'm making custom audience for it from the last seven days and make lookalikes spanning from zero to one, zero to three, zero to five, zero to seven, and zero to 10%. I also find zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to five looks works well as well. So if you want to test both of them out or test one and the other one, um, that's definitely a good idea. So once you hit 2,075% video viewers, 2,000 view contents, 500 add to carts, 500 initiate checkouts, and 150 purchases, I would make lookalikes for them using the same percentage structure that was used for the 95% video viewers. These campaigns are all going to go in a CBO, starting with at least a $100 budget and a $5 minimum ad spend. If you want to start the budget a little bit higher, make sure the minimum ad spend is the CBO budget divided by two and then divided by the number of ad sets. So that's why when you get a $100 CBO campaign, that's why I use $5 minimum budgets. I just use that formula to determine um, what the minimum ad spend is. The reason this, this, um, this formula works is because it divides the CBO budget by two and then evenly distributes it amongst the ad sets. So it gives it every single ad set a chance to, to, to convert. And then the other half of the budget gets allocated to the best performing ad sets. If you have any questions about what I just said, just leave a comment down below or hit me up on Instagram and I'll be more than happy to explain. 
So for the scaling and killing of the campaign, I will let them run for at least three days to give the campaign a chance to optimize. After three days, if you get zero sales, kill it. If it is unprofitable, but has sales, let it run for another day. And after the next day, turn off any ad sets that spent over 1.5 times your break even cost per purchase and duplicate the ad sets that are profitable. So if your campaign is profitable and you have the budget, duplicate the campaign. If your ROAS is 2.5 or more, duplicate the campaign and double the budget. Or if it is profitable and the ROAS is less than 2.5, just simply duplicate the campaign. So personally, I don't like increasing CBO budgets because I find when touching a budget, it sometimes has a negative effect on the performance of the campaign. It doesn't always have a negative effect on the performance of the campaign, but in my experience, when I've scaled by increasing budgets before, it sometimes works, but it sometimes throttles the, the performance. So what I like to do is just play it safer and just duplicate and increase if need be. Also, a really important factor when scaling is to always test new creatives. Your creative, when you have a winning product and you're scaling really hard, it will eventually fatigue. And this is something that I was doing constantly. I was constantly utilizing my creative testing strategy and testing new creatives so that once I saw the CTR slowly start to drop, I would just throw a new one in. So I definitely suggest creating a creative testing campaign for yourself and using the testing structure that I outlined in the previous video of this channel or the one that the previous video that I created so you can find a new creative. So a sign of ad fatigue is when you see your CTR going down day by day. Literally when I would look at my ads manager, you know, one day after the other, it would just go down by let's say 0.05% every single day. And as your CTR goes down, that means the amount of money that you're spending is not being utilized as efficient as possible. So that's why you want to, the second you see this, I would cycle in a new creative so that you can keep things fresh. So for retargeting, I like to create a warm retargeting and a hot retargeting campaign. For the warm retargeting campaign, I'll target 75% video viewers, 95% video viewers, and people that are engaged with the post. For all types of retargeting campaigns, I exclude purchases as well as the next step in the funnel. So this might sound confusing. So for example, for people that engage, if you're retargeting people that engage with your post, I would exclude page views and purchases. And for if you're retargeting 75% video viewers, I would exclude 95% video viewers, page views and purchases. The reason you want to do this is because you want to segment your audience so that there's no overlap. And for hot retargeting, I target people that viewed content, add it to cart. And for hot retargeting, I also offer a 10% discount to sweeten the deal. So creators wise, I test various types of retargeting creatives. I always test one video and one image, and I test a scarcity angle as well as a customer testimonial for the ad copy. And lastly, for the budget, I like to have my retargeting campaign budget about 10% of my cold prospecting budget. And I like to do that because any more than that, you're showing your ads way too much to your warm and hot audiences, and you just end up spamming them. So with that being said, that brings me to the end of this video. If you made it this far, Thank you so much. And as a thank you, if you comment on this video, you know, if you ask a question, just send an emoji, any sort of comment, and you follow my Instagram at JeremyIU, I will be giving away one free 15 minute consultation call. All you have to do again is just leave a comment, whatever you want, and follow me on Instagram. So again, thank you for watching this video, and I can't wait to see you guys next time.